talking about one of the very important topics in geomorphology that is earthquake. Now you must all have heard about earthquakes but the real cause, the cause, of, uh, the regions where earthquakes are prominent and its impact is a major, uh, major section that we would be discussing in this lecture. Now starting with what is earthquake, I can say if you have a block that is in equilibrium and that equilibrium is disturbed due to sudden release of energy from beneath would be uh, leading to breaking down of this block or there could be tempers in form of fractures or cracks or faults that could occur here and that would be what would be an impact of an earthquake. So I can say if there is a sudden release of energy around the regions where there is a fault it would be a kind of uh, earthquake that could be uh, experienced. So you have a point where you have the center of the earthquake. I could say the waves move on in a fashion that the impact of earthquake decreases as we move away from the center. Now where does this energy come from that leads to the cause for the earthquake? I could say interior of the earth that we have already studied has huge uh, kind of energy in form of heat and that energy if dissipated towards the surface which is mainly driven by the forces of gravity and interior heat of the earth would lead to the phenomena of earthquake. Now some basic things that we need to know about earthquake. It's not earthquake that kill people. It's the buildings that kill people. What does that mean? Earthquake just affects the uh, surroundings or the uh, landscape and the destruction of the landscape leads to killing of the people. Then you have the magnitude and the intensity of the earthquake that we would be studying throughout our lecture. We would also understand the various kind of waves that occur in the process of earthquake, the major regions where earthquake are concentrated and how to predict the earthquake. Now starting with we will understand some basic terms. The first term is focus. Focus is the region beneath the earth surface where the earthquake initiates. So it's the region. So this is the surface I could say and the region beneath the surface is the focus or the main point where the earthquake originates. The point directly overhead the focus which lies on the earth surface is known as epicenter. So epicenter is the point directly above the focus lying on the surface of the earth that's the epicenter. All the waves that start from the focus and move towards the surface would be known as body waves and all the waves that finally occur on the surface are known as surface waves as the name suggests. So these are some of the basic terminologies that we would be frequently discussing throughout our lecture. So we must be very clear about what is focus, what is epicenter, what are body waves and what are surface waves. Now we would be covering this section for both the point of view of MCQ and long answers. So those preparing for long answers I suggest that you pay attention to the uh, flow in which we are going. So first we would be talking about the terminology then we would be uh, talking about the causes and the distribution. So while writing your answers for, uh, for any examination specifically UPSC mains it is important that you follow a sequence and that is very important when you answer uh, descriptive questions. Now there are some confusing terms that students get confused with that are isoseismic lines and homoseismal lines. Isoseismic lines are the lines that join the points of same intensity or damage caused by the earthquake. So if I say on a Richter scale it is a magnitude of 8.8, 8.8 and 8.8 that would be an isosismal line because it is joining the points of equal intensity or equal damage I could say while homosismal lines are the lines which join uh, the points where the earthquake uh, tremors were felt at a particular time. So if I say 8 o'clock in the morning 
I felt tremors in these three locations. So the line joining these three locations would be an homosysmal line because it is joining the line, joining the points which had felt the tremors of earthquake at the same time. So it deals with time and isosysmal deals with intensity. The next is why do earthquakes occur? There are two basic uh, things that is stress and strain which are the basic cause for earthquake. Now it's like a chicken egg proposition. It's hard to say whether chicken came first or the egg came first. Similarly, it's hard to say whether stress leads to strain or strain leads to stress. But both of them uh, definitely are the basic causes for the earthquake. Now stress as we know is force per unit area and force is mass multiplied by acceleration. So if I say when tectonic plates are moving uh, along one another, so in plate tectonics we studied that there are certain plates that exist and these plates move uh, parallel to one another and when they are moving there is a kind of stress that is generated at the boundaries of the plate and this stress leads to deformation. Now deformation can be in various ways there can be plastic deformation which do not lead to earthquake, elastic deformation where rocks are stretched and because of the stretch there is a breaking point. We will understand it in the next animation. Then there is flow which is the viscous behavior and the fracture which is brittle in case of solids. So here you have a diagram as you can see there is an elastic rebound, there was a rebound and you can see there is a uh, tumbling down of the tree that is lying here. So as the plates move due to elastic deformation you have the tumbling down of the tree that can be seen. Now the next is strain. Strain means if I have a rubber band which is say 5 centimeters long, I stretch it and make it say 6 centimeters long. Now what would happen? Where would this extra 1 centimeter energy came from? To stretch this extra 1 centimeter, I could say the amount of strain that was applied was 1 by 5. So since the original length is 5 and the stretched amount is 1, I could say the amount of strain that was applied by 1 by 5 or 20% of the energy was used as a strain. So strain leads to stress but also we can say stress leads to strain. So it's kind of uh, a unit which is dimensionless because you are dividing the same uh, kind of units here. So it's a dimensionless quantity. So strain is a dimensionless quantity and it leads to deformation. So the original rubber band is now de deformed and it is stretched, for, stretched further. So these two things are the main reasons which lead to formation of earthquakes. Now <coughs> the basic causes of earthquake. When I say causes of earthquake there could be various reasons that could lead to uh, for formation of earthquakes. One of the major reason is plate tectonics. Then you have the volcanic activity. So if I say we previously mentioned the Pacific Ring of Fire in the class on tsunamis. So you have the American side, the North America and the South America and here you have the Japan, uh, the coast of Russia and this is the Pacific Ocean. So the belt that surrounds this region is the Pacific Ring of Fire and across this Pacific Ring of Fire there is numerous volcanic activities and these volcanic activities are a foundation ground for numerous earthquakes. So you have like uh, the north coast, the west coast of California and Oregon states of Washington that could be seen on the North American coast, uh, the North American, uh, sorry, this side. So if I, the diagram was wrongly drawn. So this would be the coast of uh, Russia and Japan and this is the Pacific Ocean. So the west coast of North America would be the region where you have the Pacific Ring of Fire and along this coast you have numerous volcanic activities like Mount Hood, St. Helens towards the northern coast of America. 
And similarly, in the Japan, you have numerous volcanic activities which lead to earth, frequent earthquakes in that region. Again, there can be anthropogenic regions or man-induced, I could say human-induced regions that could lead to formation of earthquakes. One of the example is Bhatsa Dam in India. Then you have in Greece, it's Matheson Dam. So these were some of the regions that, uh, that were prone to earthquake due to construction of the dams. Then there can be crustal contractions that occur due to numerous other factors like sudden temperature changes or drastic changes in the uh, equilibrium that could lead to crustal contractions. Now plate tectonics that's one of the major reasons. Divergent plate boundaries are the regions where plate boundaries move away. So you have the mid oceanic ridge. Uh, so if I say about Atlantic Ocean. So this is the Atlantic Ocean and you have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So you have the plates that are drifting away. The regions where the plates are drifting away are prone to earthquake. Similarly, where there is uh, one plate that is colliding with another and it's a kind of convergent plate boundaries as in case of St. Andrew's Fault or towards the western coast of California would be examples of convergent plate boundaries and then there can be transform boundaries which slip past one another as the case of mid-continental belt or I could say the Himalayan mountain range uh, would be another case, uh, Himalayan would be the case for the convergent and then you have the case for the slip mountains as well. So you have the plate tectonics activity that you can see here. So you have the three kind of boundaries that's divergent, this is convergent and this is transform or slip past one another. Now, there can be areas of strike slip which have which are prone to earthquakes now when i talk about a strike slip, a strike slip boundaries or faults they can be either left fault or right fault so if the rock drops down towards the left it would be left and towards the right it would be right lateral fault then you have the normal and the reverse fault an interesting characteristic to help you understand the normal and reverse fault would be you have a piece of block, we will first understand the normal and then we will move on to the reverse. So what I have is a, a well here. If there is a normal fault, what would happen? This well would uh, cross just one horizon at a time. So you have the dark blue, the light blue and the brown horizons that would, it would be crossing. But if you have a well here, what would happen? In case of reverse fault, in case of reverse fault, it would be crossing the same zones twice. So this zone and this zone are same, then 2 and 2 are same, and 3 and 3 are same, and this is the well. So this well would be crossing each of the zone twice. So that would be a case in the uh, while understanding the reverse faults. Now coming on to the most important topic is the types of waves. Now types of waves we can broadly classify as body waves and surface waves. When we were discussing terms we first talked about focus, epicenter on the surface. All the waves can move from focus to epicenter would be the body waves while all the moves, uh, waves moving on the surface would be the surface waves. So body waves and surface waves is the first classification. Now consider I have a piece of spring with me. Okay, uh, let's consider this to be a piece of spring. What would happen if I apply a force that compresses and releases it? If I am compressing and releasing it, that would be a kind of compressional force and it would lead to formation of body waves. While on the other hand, if I have a piece of string with me and if I am vibrating it in this manner, it would be leading to formation of it would be stuck at one place and there would be vibrations which would lead it up and down and that would lead to the surface waves. So that's the basic difference between the body waves and the surface waves. Surface waves are the slowest waves as compared to body waves. Under body waves we define it in two waves, uh, two waves that is primary and secondary waves, P waves or S waves and then you have the surface waves which include the Rayleigh waves and the L waves or love waves. Now, the most important among all these fours are the P waves and the S waves and the region in which the P waves and the S waves cross. So,
so p waves are longitudinal in nature while s waves are transverse in nature p waves are also known as primary waves compressional waves or longitudinal waves now the region in which the p waves do not pass through or are refracted would lead to a region where there would be p shadow zone which we will see further and these waves are the first to be detected with highest velocity on the other hand s waves are transverse in nature they are also known as secondary waves or shear waves since they are shear waves they are caused by shear stress and since they are caused by shear stress they cannot penetrate gas or liquid so these waves cannot penetrate into gas or liquid so they are uh, they can move only through the solid regions if it is sh it would be horizontal it would move side by side if it is sv it is vertical it would move up and down so you have an understanding of the compressional wave and the surface wave as i explained before now p waves versus s waves as i said both originate from the same focus and both begin at the same time so they are originating from the focus not the epicenter first of all so both are occurring at the same time while s waves can transverse only solids p waves can go through solids as well as liquids it has a force that appears as push and pull force so you have push pull mechanism that is commonly prevalent here the speed of p waves is much higher as compared to s waves while a normal s waves moves at a velocity of around at a speed of around uh, 4.5 km per second while primary waves moves around 8 to 9 km per second and p waves lead to the first movements of the earthquake now in this diagram as you can see the white lines indicate the p waves so these are the p waves now p waves as you can see here are refracted towards the inner liquid and this is the region where you have the p shadow zone while all the s waves i'll use another color here so all the s waves are getting uh, get lost here and cannot penetrate the inner liquid core as a result this whole region from here to here would be the s shadow zone so s waves would be would not be found in this region and this would be the s shadow zone while this section would be the p shadow zone and here you will have a kind of refracting waves for p waves that could be seen here so this is how p waves and s waves is spread now the next is surface waves as we said the speed of the surface waves is slower than the p waves and the s waves or the body waves i could say now surface waves are of two types rayleigh waves and l waves l waves or love waves have been recently discovered say 1991 was the time frame where it was discovered it leads to horizontal shifting of the earth it is faster than the rayleigh waves and it uh, converts I, i could say it is 90% of the speed of s waves while rayleigh waves are slower as compared to l waves they are again the surface waves uh, they are located towards the surface however there can be uh, retrograde it can be retrograde or prograde in nature if i say retrograde it's found in lesser heights while prograde is found in uh, great depths so great depth you would have prograde waves prograde waves and if there is less depth you would have retrograde rayleigh waves so these are further two classification and during the in plane at the amplitude increases as we move further so this is how the movement of waves takes place so p waves as you can see it's a kind of push and pull so here is one particle and here is this particle so as you can see it is getting pulled and then it is being pushed while s waves is moving up and down and this is the main center and finally you have the surface waves which move towards the surface so you have the particle that's moving up and down with the wave and that's an example of surface wave so this is how we understand the movement of seismic bed, uh, seismic waves now the distribution of earthquake as i said mid continental belt that's the himalayan belt 
forms around 21% of the earthquake but however 68% of the earthquakes are found in the circumpacific belt or I could say the ring of the fire region. Now mid continental belt is further divided in east India and east African belt. Then you have the mid Atlantic ridge within the ocean and then you have the Gulf of Aden that also forms some of the uh, earthquake activities or the region prone to earthquake activities. So this is how we understand the distribution. So in the global map if I say this is the region of ring of fire, this is the mid continental belt, this is the Gulf of Aden belt and this is the mid Atlantic ridge. These are the major areas where you have uh, earthquake activities that could be seen. <coughs> Again this diagram shows the west side of Americas, the north and the south America and the east side of uh, Eurasian continent and the east of Australia and east southeast Asia you have the region which falls under the ring of fire. So this region demarcates the Pacific ring of fire which is prone to numerous earthquake activities. Now measuring the strength of earthquake, there are various ways to measure the strength of earthquake. Uh, the three of these are explained here, the Mercilli scale, the Richter scale and the moment magnitude scale. Now Mercilli scale ranges from 1 to 12, 1 being the least and 12 being the most severe form of earthquake. While Richter scale is a logarithmic scale which is based on log calculations, the most important thing is if I move from 6 to 7 on a Richter scale that means the amplitude has increased 10 times but the wave energy is increased 32 times. So if I say the strength of an earthquake on a Richter scale was 6, that means it was 10 times less as compared to an earthquake of an intensity of 7, of a magnitude of 7 and the wave energy was 32 times less as compared to an earthquake with a, magnitude, with a Richter scale reading of 7. Then you have the moment magnitude scale. This is the formula to read the moment magnitude scale where M0 is the magnitude in dyne centimeters. So these are three of the basic formulas. Now this diagram compares the magnitude of Richter scale and Mercilli scale. As you can see 11 and 12 on a Mercilli scale is equivalent to 8 on a Richter scale that means severe devastations in the region. And then you have the classification that you can refer. Now how does a seismograph work? You can see a ball is being hanged from a L uh, in this diagram and in the first case this shows stable while the other case there is a kind of bend that is seen and this is exactly how a seismograph works. So seismograph is an instrument that gets the reading for the earthquakes in the region. So the movement of the nip of the pen of seismograph moves with the vibrations of the earth. As and as the vibrations increases, the movements become faster and faster. So this slow movement would gradually turn into a faster movement. So here is a recording from an actual seismograph which is located at Mount uh, at St. Helens in west coast of uh, United States. So you can see here you have a reading of a seismograph and this is the nip that moves forward and records the kind of vibrations on the piece of paper. However, if the vibrations become strong, or if the vibrations on the earth surface become strong, these waves, these markings on the paper would get more and more steeper and there would be kind of sudden fluctuations that would be seen in the readings. So here you have a diagram. You have the normal waves that are seen in a similar fashion. Then if there is a sensation that the earthquake is about to come, the first wave that, that would be sensed would be the P wave and it would be steep and then there would be S waves and finally there would be a series of surface waves that would be recorded on the seismograph. So this is how recording of a seismograph takes place and it um, gets severe with time. So this is the early phase of earthquake and this is the later phase of the earthquake. Now when we talk about earthquakes, it depends upon two things that's the magnitude and the intensity. So magnitude is uh, how strong an earthquake appears to an observer, uh, th that's the intensity whereas magnitude is the amount of energy released from the interior of the earth. 
it is determined mainly by the seismic records and uh, the previous records i could say now the intensity depends on certain things how far you are from the epicenter what is the depth of the focus how deep is the uh, focus of the earthquake what are the rocks that are underlying in the structure so if there are very strong rocks the impact would be lesser as compared to weak rocks and then the amount of energy that, that is dissipated towards the epicenter here is a list of some of the major earthquakes that have occurred across the history now the impacts of earthquake when i talk about impact we can broadly classify impact as geographical impact or economic impact so we'll first talk about the geographical impact geographical impact would be there could be landslides in the region there could be damming of the floods uh, the flood prone area rising or lowering of the sea level formation of faults uh, changes in the sea coast level towards the coastal region then there can be changes in the path of the river uh, there if if the earthquake is underground it could lead to tsunamis as we have discussed in the previous class and there could be vertical or lateral displacement of the crust if i say vertical it's this way and lateral would be this way so it can be a vertical or a lateral displacement of crust now the economic impact would be if supposedly there is a uh, electric line that is lying in that region and due to earthquake there is a electricity breakdown so that would impact the economy of the region there could be life of loss of life and property falling of the buildings fire uh, spread of diseases now again impacts i could classify as geographic and economic and we can also classify it as primary and secondary so if i say primary impact what it would be it would be exactly due to the faulting and the actual geographical problems that would occur while secondary impacts would be the primary impact is the uh, due to faulting all the power lines have broken down and there could be a fire so this fire would be a secondary impact and loss of property or loss of life would be again a secondary impact so this is how earthquake devastations occur now management of earthquake there can be early warning systems that could be involved uh, installed specifically in the regions which are highly prone to earthquakes you would you could get expertise training in the region then there is a concept of 3r that is rescue relief and rehabilitate so once there is a region where earthquake has occurred the first thing that you need to do is to rescue people provide them relief and finally rehabilitate them to new locations it is done by coordinated efforts by local authority and government control and then the most important thing is earthquake resistant buildings which are commonly seen in japan which is a region prone to frequent earthquakes so the designs of the building is such that it moves the building kind of floats with the waves of the earthquake so if there is an earthquake wave the building would move along with the wave or the vibrations on the earth and therefore earthquake resistant buildings are very important and long term predictions and planning would help in curbing the problems of earthquake and managing earthquakes so these are some of the important things that we have discussed regarding earthquake in the further classes we would be covering volcano and other geomorphological features you can subscribe to our channel for any further updates have a good day ahead